Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. Today, my guest is Larry Tentarelli from the Blue Chip Daily Trend Report, uh, talking about some uh, some stocks to pay attention to. You know, we have a situation where this continued rotation away from tech into other places. We're going to focus a little bit on industrials today and how you've seen some emerging strength uh, in, in a number of different pockets. Airlines, not as much, though. We're going to talk about some of the ways to compare some of these different uh, different groups within industrials. Metals getting hit hard today with gold and silver down in a big way. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. As we look at these markets together, if you like volatility, you will love a day like today with all sorts of movements. But the key to uh, you know good long-term investing for sure is to pay attention to the long-term trends, understand how things are evolving. But Main, making special allocation or making special attention, paying attention to uh, when there's an uh, inflection points, when there's a rotation happening. And as we've talked about in recent weeks, there's clearly a rotation away from technology leadership and into other places. It certainly seems to be the case. And rotation like that doesn't happen immediately. It's not a, a, an immediate turning point. Usually it's more of a rotation. Having said that, you've had sudden movements in things like gold and silver, you know, assets that had gone parabolic, that it felt like they could go nowhere but up, all of a sudden coming, uh, coming back down to earth. So what does that mean for the longer term trends? We're going to try to focus on as much as those, uh, those different things uh, as we can. And, and again, the goal is focus on some of the long term trends. Now, it's not just me helping you along this journey of, uh, of trend following and momentum investing. We have some fantastic guests. As I mentioned, Larry Tentarelli uh, joining us from New Hampshire today. Uh, tomorrow, we have Jane Galina from cjanetrade.com. On Thursday, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer. Next week on the show, on Tuesday, we have Jesse Felder. And on Wednesday, the 19th, Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. Also, a reminder, this coming Thursday, the 13th, is our next episode of The Pitch. I will be moderating this discussion with three fantastic strategists, all bringing five ideas with them. They'll each have a chance to pitch their five ideas to you. And then I'll have a chance to uh, debate those uh, with the group. And we've done this a number of times before. It's a ton of fun to just uh, you know, bring ideas. We'll leave with actionable ideas, but also some great insights in terms of how people are screening through and looking for some of those opportunities they're sharing with you. So it, it should be a really good time. This coming up this Thursday, uh, our next episode of The Pitch. Uh, let's continue on to our, uh, our market recap. I did want to start with a poll. As you, as you know, on the Stock Charts TV page and anywhere you see our content, we're always trying to ask, uh, some questions. This, to be totally honest, was a bit of a leading question, so apologies for that. I, I sort of, uh, I sort of led you into an answer here, but the question was this: If you had only one thing to use to determine whether to buy a particular stock, which would it be? A most recent quarterly financial statement, a most recent annual report, a recent interview with the CEO, or a chart? And 91% of you, thank you, Team Stock Charts, Team Final Bar, coming in strong with a uh, with a chart, which I would agree. If I had one. I would probably use the chart more than anything else. But so, so two reasons for asking this question. One is just to reinforce the value of charts for understanding the dynamics behind a stock. The chart for me tells the story of the investability of a particular idea. The second part of bringing this up though is, is to say that I don't think all of those other things are unimportant or unnecessary or should be ignored. And I tell you, people that just invest in charts and don't realize that they're companies with company risk and with headline risk and management risk and all those things that cause an equity and action change. I think you're shortchanging your ability to understand a little more deeply. I think the, the best investors I've had a chance to work with combine the fundamental analysis, the reasons why themes are working and stories are working and companies are able to grow earnings over multiple years 
and the chart which tells you how investors are actually treating uh, that, that stock and, and, and relating a good company and a good stock together, I think is most important. So yeah, yes, I definitely led you to a chart and I agree that is the correct answer if I had to pick one. Uh, but please don't think that those other things are, are unimportant. I think there's value in, in each of those other things as long as it's part of a, a complete process, a holistic process driven by an understanding of price momentum. Let's continue our discussion about uh, the, uh, the, the market environment, recapping what's happened uh, today, focusing back on the, uh, on the changes. Quite a sell-off in stocks going into, uh, into the close. The dynamics of this day actually fluctuated dramatically uh, as, the, as the day went on, really uh, you know, uh, fell off in the last two hours of trading with the S&P finishing 33.33, 0 uh, 0.8% down from, uh, from yesterday. Uh, you know, in terms of stories, though, the, the technology rotation, you know, continuing to see distribution in, uh, in the NASDAQ 100, in the XLK, certainly exaggerated here again today with the tech sector down 1.8%, while the S&P was down 0.8%, so over double, over double the sell-off uh, on the downside. Interesting to see financials, industrials, the two sectors finishing in the positive, while technology, real estate, utilities really drove the way uh, to, the, uh, to the downside. So quite a separation from uh, gainers to losers. Very quickly at some other markets, and then we're going to look at some of the charts together. Uh, bonds certainly distributed again today. Came up a little bit at the, uh, in the last hour of trading, but the TLT still finishing down 1%. Ten-year yields back above uh, 65 basis points now. The real story in terms of the real movements, I would say, though, is in the commodity complex with gold uh, going down over 5% in the form of the GLD. The SLV, one of the silver ETFs, down almost 14%. So these are uh, markets that have been in, you know, exaggerated uptrends, parabolic uptrends. Uh, let's look at a chart of the, uh, of the uh, silver ETF here very quickly. Here's the SLV, and this is the chart as of yesterday. We're hitting 27, and it's, you know, questions I've gotten all along this way, you know, is that sustainable? And my comment to all of you is, yeah, charts like this can keep going up much longer than you think that they should. And you've seen that with silver, with gold, with commodities. You've seen it with Bitcoin. You've seen it with um, uh, Tesla. I mean, any of, these, any of these stocks that go vertical, you know, bubbles and, 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 and accelerated rises that come down to earth are very easy to spot in the rearview mirror. But as they're happening, you know, I originally, when I was first reading about charts like this and experiences like this, I was afraid to chase anything like this because it felt like you were just chasing uh, something that was going vertical. But what I learned from my time working with institutions is that that's, a, you know, going from 17 up to 27, you, you want to be there for part of that. You've got to find ways to participate as well as you can and just keep a, a good eye on the, on the risk and make sure you're managing that effectively. And don't make this your entire portfolio making a bet like this, but get exposure to things that, that are exaggerating. But there's lots of money, of money to be made on bubble, not, not saying that we're in a commodity bubble, but just this phenomenon of a quick rise and quick pop. Uh, you know, there's plenty to be, of money to be made on the upside of those things. And it's, and it's all about ratcheting up your stops and paying attention to, uh, to your overall risk. So silver coming down pretty significantly, closing at 27 yesterday, down to 23 on the, uh, on the SLV. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. And this chart certainly changed over the course of the day pretty quickly. But, you know, here's the situation. As we've talked for a while now, S&P 3400, clearly a very important level. We've now you know, eclipsed the J uh, January high on the S&P. We have not eclipsed the February high yet. We now, as of the uh, today's close, have a bearish engulfing pattern with a, uh, a down day where the body engulfs the real body from the uh, previous day. So now we have a short-term sell signal that is lining up fairly well with an overall uh, significant resistance level as the S&P nears that uh, 3,400 range. So, you know, now we have a short-term distribution signal right as the, uh, as the uh, market is reaching a key, uh, a key uh, level of interest. This is also as the RSI just became overbought over the last couple of days. So overall, what's this, what this suggests is the remainder of the week, certainly leaning more negative than positive uh, in, in that short-term tactical frame. It's worth remembering that this long-term uptrend is still very much in play. Even the chart of silver that we just looked at I don't think that tells you that the uptrend is over. It certainly tells you we're coming off of an extreme value. What's going to happen, I won't say, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving an absolute where there is none. There's never an absolute in investing, but the base case that I, I feel like we've, we've either talked about or maybe I've just said it in my head, you know, for me, this level right around here, around this 3,200, 3,250, this is the resistance from June. This became the support there in mid 
July. I think it's reasonable to assume we would take a pause either right here or at or nearly above 3,400, but right in that sweet spot of where that makes sense. A pullback down to around 3,200, 3,250 makes a ton of sense. And what's going to happen there is that satisfies everyone. Bulls are validated because you have a viable pullback within an uptrend. Bears are validated because you have some distribution after you've seen uh, essentially none. I, I don't I don't think there's much of a question as to what happens here. I think it's fair to assume we get a pullback. I think the real question is what happens here. And if we're able to hold that level and establish a higher low, which would give uh, you know momentum, uh, certainly uh, you know, you could recalibrate and continue the next leg higher. Or if we fail there and fail below the 52, uh, 50 day moving average, fail below 3,200, below the swing low from July, all of a sudden that feels a lot more distributive. And I think we'll continue to see those rotations, maybe even to more of the defensive places like utilities and real estate that we certainly did not see today on the, uh, on the brief pullback. So a lot to be, to be thought about as we, uh, as we continue on over the, the rest of the, uh, the week here. Financials, just to finish off, I think financials are an interesting story. We dug into that uh, on, uh, on uh, oh, I think, the end of last week, beginning of this week, whenever it was, dug into the financials a little more deeply and focused on some of those themes, some of those charts that have emerged in a position of strength, certainly uh, following through on the, uh, on the XLF rallying today. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Larry Tantarelli. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday for our show. As a reminder, two ways to get your questions to us, also your feedback, ideas, uh, anything that you want to share with us. Number one, via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, or on Twitter, just tag us in a comment, at FinalBarSCTV. We're going to do another mailbag segment a little later in today's show. We'll do another one at the end of the week, so we'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. So let us know uh, what's on your mind. I want to welcome on my guest, Larry Tantarelli. Larry is a publisher and the editor of the Blue Chip Daily Trend Report. I was chatting with uh, Larry beforehand, who's in New England, and I have very, very fond memories, uh, Larry, of living in the Boston area, traveling up to New Hampshire. So uh, I'm, I'm living vicariously through you as you describe what you're, what you're looking at out the window. But thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Dave, good afternoon. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course. Now, I've followed your work, I think, with, with many others on social media. You do such a, you're so generous with ideas and what you're thinking. You've brought two of those ideas with you, and I'd love to hear, uh, you know, sort of what you're thinking. As, as we talked about in the, in the market recap, the S&P sort of at this key level, but I feel like there are always opportunities out there. You're, you're starting us in the, in the industrial space, which certainly has emerged. Tell us about Caterpillar and what you're seeing here. Sure. So Caterpillar is a stock that I, I just took a position in this yesterday, as a matter of fact. And, and what I've seen over the past few weeks as I run my screeners is the industrials and the cyclicals, especially those names over the 200-day moving average, have just been making nice, steady uptrends. And if you look at the Caterpillar chart, you can see it pretty much has a series of few higher highs. It's got higher lows. It's over the, the rising 50-day moving average, and the 50 just crossed the 200-day. And, and it's fairly close. It tested, uh, looks like 146 and change today. So it tested a new 52-week high today. And for the, the trend analysis that I do, Caterpillar is set up very, very well, especially if it can clear 147.50 for a move higher. It's a great chart. And, and, and again, I, I love following your work, but I think one of my favorite things you just said was the simplicity of it's making higher highs and higher lows at a time when not everything is. So I think that's, that's key. And, and I, you know, just being above the upward sloping moving averages makes a ton of sense. Now, materials is another space. I know a lot of investors are sort of debating sort of where, where to be looking. You're, you're highlighting Freeport Macmoran for us, FCX. Tell us about this chart. Freeport, if you look at the trend, it's very similar to the Caterpillar trend. It's got the rising 50-day moving average. The 50 recently crossed the rising 200 days. So that's, that's indicating an uptrend on multiple time frames. You've got a series of higher highs, higher lows. It recently broke out to 52-week highs. 
It's consolidating a little bit here. Uh, copper's pulled back a little bit over the past few days, but but Freeport is another one that for my time frame, that's a very steady uptrend. It looks like it's ready to uh, break out to a new high. So it's interesting. I, these are two fantastic charts, and I and I love the the illustration of just the you know these classic two classic uptrends. You know, it strikes me as you you know we're talking today as you know gold and silver you know came off pretty heavily today, right? With silver down double digits. So you know the you know I I I look at a chart like this and just think about potential downside risk. When you're looking at this through your process, what would you consider as sort of an exit strategy? What would you see on a chart like this that would tell you, okay, that wasn't right. This is no longer an uptrend. Is it a is it a change in the the trend? Lower lows, lower highs. Is it breaking through a, a level or a moving average? Like tell tell us how you would you know think about the downside risk on something like this. That that's a great question. Twelve fifty is the first place on any shorter term pullback. I'd want to see twelve fifty hold. If that broke down, then the fifty day below it, and then pretty much under twelve dollars would tell me that that uptrend is is probably uh, under you know in question. And under pressure. So really 1250, the 50 day moving average for me would be the key uh, trend filter here. And then below $12 would, would signal more weakness. Now, if I could ask you a, a question, we talked in the in the recap, Larry, about just the overall market environment. We've got this, you know, situation where the S&P is, you know, threatening or, or at the very least testing all time highs here around 3,400. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as you illustrated, there are, there are charts out there that look pretty good, but I think everyone is sort of eyeing this January or February high and with a little bit of hesitancy and, and thinking, you know, do we have enough momentum to, to continue on further? Do you have an overall view of just where we're at in the cycle? And if, uh, and if you're more in the, we continue to all-time highs camp or more of a we need a deep correction here or somewhere in the middle? How would I'm you describe your perspective? Yeah, I'm in the middle. So I agree with what you said. So the S&P was up, I believe, seven days in a row coming into today. So the S&P has been on a pretty solid run. It would make sense some type of a shorter term pullback, but I'm looking at the same levels that you are. So just by looking at your chart, Somewhere between 3150 to 3200, I would consider consider a constructive pullback if it even got there. But I'm in the camp based on the stock charts that that I'm looking at and going sector by sector. There's definitely been a breakdown in the cloud stocks, in the high relative strength momentum stocks. A stock mm. like Zoom broke down today. Some of the cloud names have broken down. But when I look under the surface, and if you look at these industrials base metals, uh, the banks are improving, Morgan Stanley's been picking up. So overall, I see, I see it as constructive because the market seems to be shifting from gravitating only to these high momentum cloud stocks, and it seems to be broadening. Small caps have been picking up, small cap value's been picking up, the Dow's been improving. So, so we could have a shorter term pullback after seven up days, but under the surface, I see some very constructive charts. Larry, it's so good to have you on the show. I really appreciate you coming by. And, and I mentioned in one of the promos we did for, for your interview here today, every time you share a chart on social media, I scratch my head and wonder why I wasn't able to find that because you seem to just be very good at finding good ideas. So I, you're doing something right over there. And thank you so much for bringing two of those ideas with you today. Really appreciate it. Dave, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. This is Larry Tenzarelli. Larry's a publisher of the Blue Chip Daily Trend Report on social media. He does a great job, very generous, sharing, uh, sharing ideas, and very cool to hear a little bit behind the scenes of his process looking at uh, two, uh, two names, Caterpillar and, uh, and Freeport. I want to continue on the show looking at the uh, final bar mailbag. As, uh, as I've mentioned many times, one of my favorite parts of this show is being able to hear from you and, and what you're struggling with, what questions you have, and trying to go through some of those themes and ideas uh, with you together. Let's get right to it. Question number one, now that Disney is post earnings and has broken out to the upside, is this a confirmation of the bull flag pattern, uh, similar to your discussion about the S&P 500 flag pattern uh, in May? Let's bring up that chart and we'll take a look at it. So here's a chart at Disney. It's actually interesting to, uh, to note. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a stock that uh, finished up today 1.3%, while most things were struggling, or certainly the market was uh, pulling back a little more meaningfully. So so that check one in the positive column on the fact that uh, Disney's holding up okay. Uh, you know, I, and I think what you're referring to is this, you know, right, the rally out of the March lows, you then sort of have this 
uh, pattern, and now we've broken uh, broken above it. So, you know, here's the thing: when when I think about a, a bull flag pattern, I don't know how much I would call this a bull flag. I guess you could actually, right? If you would if you would call this the flag right here, it's really more of a I guess you'd call it a wedge pattern, which is when you have a pullback, but it's not really a parallel correction. A flag really should be sort of a parallel, uh, you know, pullback of the lows and the highs, sort of in a in a parallel mo motion. Here's more. It's a little more of a consolidation, which you call a wedge, but that's getting way too much into the details. The, re the, the fact is you had a rally, you had a corrective pattern, and then you broke above whatever trend line you draw there to the upside. That's all fine. For me, what's most meaningful is the fact that we have established a higher high by breaking above the June high, and we have established a higher low uh, with, a, with a higher low here the last week in, uh, in July after a, a low uh, the last week in June. So, you know, just like, like Larry was pointing out on some of the, the charts that he shared, I think, you know, for me, higher highs and higher lows is encouraging. The fact that Disney is now back above its 200 day moving average, back above its most recent swing high. I think it's, it's set it up. It, it's set up very, very well. And I think uh, all else being equal, I think you, you look for it to continue to go up uh, from here. I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. Question number two, um, this actually came to us on Twitter. How can the market rally so high with more bears volume than bulls? Always something that intrigued me. And this chart we were looking at was actually this one. I posted this on, uh, on Twitter and you responded to this and, uh, and put that comment in there. So thanks for, thanks for the comment. And, and what's interesting is in your, the way you phrased your question uh, is not 100% true. So you said uh, with more bears volume than bulls. And I think with volume, you're just, you're just saying the number of them, which is true. Uh, remember there, that, that, that for me, uh, market analysis, macro analysis has three pieces. It's price, breadth, and sentiment. And they're in priority order of that way. Number one is price. What is the price doing? Number two importance to me is breadth. What can breadth tell me about the composition of the stocks making new highs and new lows? How does that validate what I saw in price? And then third, in what I tend to uh, characterize as more anecdotal than anything, is sentiment, right? Because price tells you what people are voting with their assets. Where are they actually putting their bets? This AAII survey is a survey. It's asking a bunch of investors, are you bullish or bearish or neutral? And there are certainly uh, plenty of times where people say they are bullish or bearish, but their bets are not 100% in line with what they say. This is more the idealized version maybe of what they're feeling, but their bets are something different. And, I, and, and as much as this is of interest, I think the price and showing what buyers and sellers are doing is most is even more relevant. So having said that, the market can rally significantly with plenty of, uh, of bears. You can see almost 50% of individual investors, according to this survey, have remained relatively bearish, even with uh, the market rallying. That can happen because they're not the only ones doing the buying. This is only individual investors. It's not institutions that are part of this bucket. And it is a small subset of less than a thousand investors that are applying to the survey. So uh, you know, so so that is the answer. It can move because there are plenty of people that would comprise this upturn that would cause assets to go up that are not represented. This is a very select group of a small number of a particular type of investor. But overall, I think it's interesting to see where the individuals are uh, are leaning and uh, and that's sort of where it is. So so again, I, I think I would keep in mind price versus breadth versus sentiment. That's how I would think of it. Next one, how do you show the longer description of each indicator? And you were looking at uh, this chart in particular when you asked the question. And I think you're talking about this part right here. Uh, how, do you, right, how do you show the longer description? I actually learned this trick following Grace and Roses as I think some of the best technical analysts uh, you know, very generously borrow from uh, those that have come before them or even those that have come a little after them. And Grace and Rose, one of my uh, stock charts, um, uh, fellow, uh, fellow, on the, uh, fellow member of the management team, his charts all have these beautiful long descriptions. And so I picked apart one of his charts and I found uh, that it's actually right here. Just below the chart, you have chart attributes. And at the end of this line, it says legend. And I usually have default, which makes your charts look like this, which is fine if you're just looking at a bunch of stocks. But when you get to a bunch of breadth indicators and the tickers are kind of obscure and you have no idea what they are, if you switch legends to uh, verbose, which is an awesome way that Chip Anderson, I think, probably set that up. It gives you this great description. So with breadth indicators, I think it's fantastic. I, I gratuitously uh, stole that from, uh, from my uh, colleague, Grayson Rose, who showed me how to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, next question. Bearish engulfing patterns in stocks like Amazon have played out as expected with a weakness for the next couple of bars. The real question is what next? To break below the trend line using the March to June lows would be one way of analyzing that. Let's look at the chart of Amazon together. 
uh, may have changed just a bit. Yes, yeah, so you're using a trend line here. I'll quickly draw sort of the chart that you had in mind. To do this one here. Right, so that's the chart that I that I uh, that I sent, and the question was a follow up to that. We broke the trend line. Now what? Which is totally fair. So I had drawn this trend line taking the low in March, the lows in uh, at the end of June. That connected pretty well with sort of mid to late July. We've now broken down that. So now what? So you know, for me, trend lines are one piece of the puzzle, and I think. You know, when you're looking at, at charts, there, it's a mosaic, right? There, there's not one thing that I look at and that's it. It's a series of things. So for me, charts like this breaking uh, a trend line are, the, are in some ways the, the first warning you would get that things are, are holding up or, or, or starting to break down a little bit. With, with a chart like Amazon, it hasn't broken a swing low yet. Um, you know, maybe it just broke above last week's low, but I, I don't think that's really enough. You know, for me on any sort of pullback with most charts, you're looking to the low sort of in early to mid July. So for me, it's just above this 2900 level, like 29, 20, 29, 30. You'd want to see a low, uh, a break below some of those lows. And on a closing basis, it's around here, 2970 uh, or so. You'd want to see a break below that level for me to indicate We've now broken down through the trend line. That's good. That puts it on the radar for me. When we break down through a new swing low, that would be important. What does the RSI do around that point? Does it remain around 40, which would be a reasonable pullback within a bull cycle, or does it break down through that? So on charts like Amazon that have sold off, that's where I'm looking and uh, the price level there, the RSI level and see, does it hold support? Does the RSI remain above 40? If that does, this all, become, all of a sudden becomes a consolidation and potentially a resumption of an uptrend. If it breaks down through that, then you have to think a little bit further about uh, downside risk. With all of those names, also the relative strength, I think, is important to look at because you see if it holds or if uh, the relative strength starts to turn uh, a little bit lower. So that's how I would think of charts like this. And I think we'll see more and more of those uh, trend line breaks, to be honest with you, given the distribution that we saw uh, just today here. Um, very last thing, we have one more question, then we have to go. Comparison charts are a good illustration for stocks relative to another asset like this one here. Should we ignore the numerical value of the relative ratios? And, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Let's do uh, this here. So right at the bottom, there's two ways you can look at performance uh, or, or relating one, one chart to another. What a lot of people do is just say price and put the little, uh, the two tickers right here. Here I'm looking at Amazon relative to the SPY and the value of that ratio is 9.26. Uh, that number, to be honest, is, is essentially irrelevant. I wouldn't pay attention to that. When you're looking at relative strength in this way, you're just looking at the direction of it. You're looking, is it, is it going up, meaning the numerator is outperforming? Is it going down, meaning the numerator is underperforming? I tend to use price dash performance, which at least normalizes this. So I see over this time frame that I've been looking at, Amazon has outperformed the S&P by 46%. You don't have to do that, but for me, it just, it gives some value uh, to that value. It gives some, uh, some meaning to that value as opposed to just a meaningless ratio, which really doesn't uh, tell you much at all. Boy, that's our mailbag, and uh, I appreciate all of those questions. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Let's get right to it. An industrial theme to today's walk that we're going to start with, and this is another question that really came through the mailbag, but I turned it into one of these charts. The question was uh, industrials, the emergence of industrials, and you looked at the equal weighted uh, version, which is the RGI. I think that's beautiful. So I set up this chart looking at the XLI, this is the industrial sector breaking above the June highs. That's good. This is industrials relative to technology, the XLI versus the XLK, but it's a cap weighted ratio. So it's really still essentially sideways. You're just breaking above that swing high, but look what happens when you do the equal weighted version, the RGI versus the RYT. You can see that that's already broken above its June high. What's this, what this tells you is that strength in technology is driven by the mega cap tech names, things like Microsoft and others, Apple, that you would know. When you take the overweight of those stocks out of it, you can see that the average industrial stock essentially has outperformed the average technology stock. That's not a new thing that actually started back here in May. So absolutely, I'd be looking for ideas in industrials if you're not already. One area where I would probably not be looking is, uh, is in airlines. This came from another question. The Jets ETF, as much as it's rallied a little bit, broken above a swing high, I still would much rather see things that are in a positive trend versus uh, the airlines uh, sector, the inter airlines industry, which I, I still think has a lot to prove. The Jets ETF is actually the first percentile out of all ETFs out there, so it's not there yet. And as one chart to look at, I'd be looking at ALGT. It finished up a little bit today, but testing a descending 200-day moving average, I'd want to see it 
break above that uh, line. Folks, that's our show for today. Thanks to Larry Tentrelli for joining us. For StockCharts.com and Rebin Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.